Uh, so just a very quick review uh, about what we covered last time, especially this pre-consolidation pressure concept um, in normally and overly consolidated clay. And these are important for today's lecture. In first for uh, pre-consolidation pressure, so as I mentioned last time, so this last bullet point, so this is the maximum effective pass pressure the clay experienced. I mentioned last time clay has a memory of its stress history. And that stress history is basically uh, characterized by this pre-consolidation pressure. So depending on the relationship between the current effective stress and this pre-consolidation pressure, clay is going to follow different loading paths for the same stress increment. So we have um, on this graph, I showed last time you have the initial loading, which has a steeper slope and you have this unloading and reloading portion, which has a flat slope. So this basically means for same given stress increment, the change in void ratio is going to, to be different depending on where the clay is on this curve. And for using the pre-consolidation pressure, so I introduced this uh, NC and OC clay concepts last time. So basically NC clays are clays where your current effective stress is the maximum the clay has ever experienced. So sigma prime equals to sigma C prime. And OC clays are basic clays where the current effective stress sigma prime is smaller than the past effective stress sigma C prime. Okay. So these are two types of uh, clays. And we define this over consolidation ratio as the ratio of pre-consolidation pressure sigma C prime over sigma prime. Okay. So that's what we covered last time. And as I mentioned, this will be important for settlement calculation. That's the focus of today's lecture. So we have a couple of things left from that pre-consolidation uh, uh, topic. The first thing is I want to discuss the reasons why clays are over-consolidated. So again, over-consolidated clay, you have sigma prime smaller than sigma C prime. So basically your current effective stress is smaller than the past maximum effective stress. And there are several reasons. There are some common reasons why this is the case. First, there was previous structures on top. Okay. So you may have an old building that had been demolished and that means when the building was on top, the clay was subjected to larger pressure, larger stress. And that's one of the reasons clay may become over consolidated. In second, you have glacier. Okay. So glacier, again, that's additional loading uh, on top. So you may have a uh, glacier on top of the, uh, in the past, so that would make clay over consolidated. And then uh, water table change also causes clay to become over consolidated. In chapter nine, uh, we discussed the change of water table on effective stress. So basically when you have, say in this case, water table was lower in the past, which means you had larger effective stress in the past. Remember the effect of lowering water table is actually in, to increase the effective stress. If you have a lower water table in the past, that means the effective stress in the soil was higher in the past. That's the other, other, another reason clays may become uh, over consolidated. And then the next one, uh, desiccation. So basically the drying. Okay. So if water body was basically uh, drying and that causes the effective stress to decrease and which means you have higher effective stress in the past. And then last one. So the weathering process basically, uh, basically you remove the uh, top soil layers and again that causes clay to become over consolidated. So all of these factors essentially are basically removing loads from clays. Uh, so that's why uh, the clays 
had larger effective stress in the past, and that become uh, that by definition is over consolidated. Okay, so these are uh, some common reasons why clays may become over consolidated. Um, a couple other topics left for um, for this pre consolidation. The first one is uh, this effect of disturbance on your void ratio versus effective stress plots. So this is something you get from the lab. And if you look at this figure here, so this is uh, NC clay curve. Okay. Uh, there are three curves on this uh, chart here. So this one is virgin consolidation curve. So that's basically undisturbed clays. So if you consolidate the clay in a field, it's going to follow this Virgin compression, virgin consolidation curve. So this is for undisturbed. And the second curve is this lab consolidation curve. Okay. So no matter how carefully you are when taking the soil sample from the field, you are going to induce some disturbance to the soil. Okay. So it's not going to be exactly the same soil. And so this lab consolidation curve, this is second one. In the extreme case, this third one is a consolidation curve for remolding the specimen. So basically, you completely disturb the sample, remote the uh, soil, and made this remolded soil specimen. Okay. So this this is basically uh, increased. If you look at the direction, so this is increased the disturbance. As you increase the disturbance, you'll notice it does mainly two things to this E log sigma prime curve. The first one, it obscures the pre-consolidation point. And the second is it decreases the uh, CC value. Okay. So it decreases this uh, uh, compression index is CC here. So that leads to underestimate of settlement. You underestimate your settlement. The effect of that is underestimate your settlement. Okay, uh, so that's the effect of disturbance on your E log P plot. So that's why, so at least here, Textbook chapter 11.9 gives you a procedure to correct the curve, to correct, correct your lab E log P curve for disturbance. And you have procedures for normally consolidated sample and overly consolidated sample. So that's disturbance. And so finally, for these two slopes, the uh, compression index CC and the recompression or swell index CS. Uh, there, are, in addition to lab consolidation tests, you can also use empirical correlations to estimate these two values. So CC value here. is related to a liquid limit, excuse me, LL. So LL is liquid Limit. So you can use uh, empirical correlations, uh, this uh, Scampton's correlation here to estimate CC based on liquid limit of clay. And then for recompression or swell index CS. So for CS, a rule of thumb is it's about one fifth to one tenth of CC. So it's much, much smaller compared to CC because it's at the flat portion of that curve. And alternatively, um, you can use the plastic index to estimate CC, uh, CS as well. So for uh, CS, it's PI over uh, 370, 370. So that's just one empirical correlation. If you look at tables uh, 11.6 in your textbook, there are other correlations for estimating CC as well. Okay. But the Scampton one is one of the most commonly used one. And the one uh, listing here, this is for undisturbed clays. 
And this is table 11.6 uh, that summarizes other correlations for this CC index. So there are different options for CC. And then for the pre-consolidation pressure sigma C prime, in addition to that lab procedure, so again, you can get CC, CS, and sigma C prime from lab, or you can use empirical correlations. And this one here is a commonly used empirical correlation where LI is liquidity index. So that's just the uh, empirical correlations. So that actually, that's um, the pre-consolidation pressure NC and OC clay. So again, so let me put a note here. So to obtain C, C, S, and sigma C prime, So the best way is to use the 1D consolidation lab test. So you can obtain from 1D consolidation test, from which you have that E and dog sigma prime plot. Okay. And from this log, E log C, sigma C prime plot, you can get these three parameters, two coefficients, uh, uh, one compression index, one swell index or recompression index and one pre-consolidation pressure. And alternatively are those empirical correlations I just listed. And if you don't have one day consolidation test data, you can estimate those values using these empirical correlations. Okay. So these are uh, different options. You can get these uh, indices. Okay. 